me just make sure this works. Fantastic. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, can we have a huge round of applause for Rory for just organizing this whole thing? I think you've just done an absolutely phenomenal job and yeah, knowing Rory for, I guess, five, six years now, uh, we're getting old. Um, I know it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, so yeah, just, just as a bit of a background, um, so uh, Matt and I, Matt's in the back, uh, we started a company a few months ago called Roundtable. Uh, we finished our PhDs at Princeton, uh, working in psychology under the supervision of Tom Griffiths. We went through uh, YC over the summer. Uh, we raised our seed round a couple months ago, um, and now we're on um, the quest for the elusive product market fit. Um, what we try to do is we try to marry the best of, say, deep tech and that academia focus with an enterprise SaaS organization. And, and what we're trying to do is try to integrate AI uh, with a lot of developments in psychology, a lot of developments in behavioral science, a lot of developments in cognitive science. Um, but in the spirit of this um, kind of a, a conference workshop, um, we're going to, I'm going to kind of try to bridge the uh, gap between academia and industry. And so I want to start off with a very seminal paper. Um, so this is the 1950 paper by Alan Turing uh, talking about the Turing test. And what he's um, trying to go after is, hey, what is artificial intelligence? What is artificial general intelligence? What are the necessary and sufficient conditions? One thing that he proposes is this Turing test, right? So the idea is that if we develop some AI system that is able to um, pretty much uh, fool a human experimenter into having a 50-50 shot about whether um, some output you know, came from a human or a machine, um, that's going to suffice as you know, passing the Turing test. And that's just actually um, you know, one really important stage of getting to artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence. OK, so last summer, uh, GPT exploded onto the scene. Um, and, and was really just a huge step function in um, the next generation of AGI. Matt and I are convinced that ChatGPT is AGI. Some of you all might disagree. We're happy to uh, argue about that later on. Uh, but um, what this is, right, so these large language models, so language is, is ultimately how um, humans communicate. And we were able to um, develop, right, a, a language model that, that had these human, if not superhuman capabilities. And this really began to, you know, I don't have to uh, explain it to this audience, really usher in a new paradigm, a paradigm shift um, in the context of artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence. And so there initially became a lot of concerns, right? Um, hey, this is actually too good. Is this taking away human cognition, human ingenuity, et cetera? Um, and so this really um, uh, smart undergrad at Princeton, Etienne, developed um, this app that he later uh, built into a company called GPT-0. And the idea is that, hey, um, what if students are plagiarizing essays or assignments just using GPT, um, right? Yeah, everyone was using Wikipedia before, but now people are using GPT. Um, can we actually detect um, what is going to be fraudulent and what is not? Um, and he's uh, built um, kind of a, or he's in the process of building a very successful company um, based on that premise. What um, you know, Matt and I got interested in is talk, thinking about this in the research sphere. Um, so this is just some pictures of the scientific method out there, right? And so you know, we collect data, we have all these hypotheses, we, we want to test them out, um, see what models work, what models don't. In cognitive science, we take this premise that the mind, the brain, is a computer, and we're going to try to identify what are the algorithms that people are using uh, to you know, do everyday decision making. And what we kind of, um, you know, what the field realized is so, you know, neuroscience was, you know, on the order of 10 subjects, psychology was on the order of 100 subjects. Uh, but with, with all these online crowdsourcing platforms, you can start to recruit um, tens of thousands, if not millions of participants using platforms like Cloud Research, Amazon Mechanical Turk, Prolific, and you'd be able to test um, your hypotheses on a um, you know, much wider array of uh, a much larger population and a much wider array of different subpopulations than ever seen before. And this has really um, been a huge shift in psychological research in the last 10 years. Um, this has come with a uh, trade-off. You all probably can't see the titles of this, but basically there's been a huge bot and fraud problem. Everyone that kind of uses Mechanical Turk knows about this. This platform has essentially been you know, 
permanently discredited or just having a huge, huge bug problem. And there's a lot of fraud kind of on these platforms, right? But now there's a new source of fraud on the scene and that's gonna be GPT based fraud, right? So you have your traditional, you know, junk actors, your bots that are just crawling and, and kind of inputting, you know, whatever you want. But now you're gonna get these human-like or superhuman kind of responses to online surveys when this is not gonna be an accurate representation um, of some, you know, uh, uh, someone who's taking a survey that you're recruiting through an Amazon Mechanical Turk or Cloud Research or whatever. And so what we've been de developing is, is a way to classify different responses and to say, hey, is this generated by a bot? Is this generated by a human? Is this generated by a GPT-based actor? And what we do is we incorporate um, a few tests, right, into surveys to say, hey, can we try to uh, what's called like these these honeypot tests. Like, hey, can we kind of attract and capture uh, these GPT-based agents, and we can flag them uh, so that, that we can exclude them from studies? And so we'll talk about just two random tests that not random, just two tests that, that we created. One, for example, what comes to your head when you think about Boston? If you look at, um, if you can track the behavior of how people, uh, you know, respond to this, saying, hey, how are they typing? Right? How many characters are they typing? What is their typing speed? What is that distribution like look over time? Are they copying and pasting or are they typing character by character? A human has a very different behavioral profile than a junk actor or a GPT based actor. And by tracking this behavior, reaction time, et cetera, we can start to classify, say, hey, who is um, a human? Who is a GPT based actor? Another example is saying, hey, um, let's we know GPT has superhuman knowledge of, say, world facts. Let's use that um, as this honeypot kind of attractor, right? So what do you think the average high temperature is in Boston for each of the following months? If you ask GPT, it's going to get near perfect accuracy. Very few humans are going to be at that rate, right? Humans are going to have somewhere that intermediate level of accuracy and, uh, you know, jump responses will be, um, you know, way, way out of distribution. And so what we're able to do is we're able to um, you know, track responses to these types of questions saying, hey, this is the probability you're a human participant, this is the probability you're a junk actor, this is the probability you're a GPT-based agent, and, and say, uh, these are the probabilities and this is the reason why we're finding you. And so what we've been doing um, in the last few weeks and month is working with, say, panel providers, market research agencies, and consulting firms that are spending hundreds of thousands, if not millions, tens of millions of dollars on these surveys um, and only to get, say, hey, 10, 20%, they have to throw that out, right? But if they're not able to accurately throw that data out, um, their analyses are going to be fundamentally flawed. We've all kind of, you know, experienced this at a, you know, um, at a scale kind of in academia, this, this problem is even greater um, in, the, in the industry. Okay, so for that first half of the talk, um, I kind of talked about GPT and this almost dystopian way that, like, hey, this is going to be a new source of fraud. Um, we have to protect ourselves against this, et cetera. Um, but for the second half of the talk, I want to talk about, hey, is there also an upside? And can we actually start to make really novel research advances um, with large language models and with what we know about cognitive and behavioral sciences? And so a few months ago, we launched um, a survey simulator on Hacker News. Hacker News is a forum for a lot of um, tech early adopters. And our premise was this, you know, large language models, foundation models, et cetera, they're trained on all internet text, essentially. And that is going to be essentially the best um, and, and the, the largest data set of human behavior to date. And we, we again, take this premise in the cognitive science and behavioral sciences that brains, minds are, are computers, People are, you know, relatively predictable, especially in aggregate situations. If we have sufficient data, we can start to predict how people are going to respond. So if we, you know, use these models that are trained on all the internet, we actually have the best models of human behavior out there. And we can start to simulate how human behavior in aggregate, as well as any type of subpopulation, will respond to any situation. And so what our idea was, was saying, hey, what if instead of actually running surveys, you could just simulate um, how people would respond to surveys, right? Using these large language models, right? Don't go out, spend thousands, tens of thousands, millions of dollars on all these surveys. 
uh, you can just go and say, hey, um, we use these large um, we use these large language models now. Uh, we can just simulate. Uh, we we can ask them to simulate how people will respond to this question. So, for example, I could ask this question: Is it important for you to use a shampoo that's cruelty free? And I'm going to estimate this for the U.S. population, and we get an estimate that says uh, I think 60, 65 percent of people say yes, 35 percent of people say no. Okay, so we get an estimate within a few seconds, rather than say running this um, you know crazy online survey. Then we can go into our data set. We can say, hey, what are the similar types of questions we've already asked in our data set? Get a sense of to what extent are we interpolating or extrapolating to answer this question, right? So we've asked similar questions in this data set. How often do you refuse to eat meat for moral or environmental reasons? How often do you avoid buying certain products for environmental reasons? So these are the most similar questions to say, hey, how would you buy a shampoo that's cruelty free? We can get a confidence score uh, based on this. And then we can say, hey, am I confident enough in my LLM generated response? Do I think we're interpolating here or is this way out of distribution and we actually need to go out and, and run that expensive survey? Where this starts to get really cool, um, if this is already not really cool enough, is that we can add conditioning questions and we can target any specific type of population. So let's say I want to target people that answer, they agree to the statement, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? I am willing to pay much higher prices in order to protect the environment. So I'm going to look at just people that agree to that statement, and I'm going to ask that same question, hey, would you buy a shampoo that's cruelty free? That number jumps up from, say, 65% to 75%. And so this way, we're able to ask any arbitrary question based in natural language because of these large language models, target um, any specific um, you know, subset of the population that can be explained by natural language, and we can start to estimate how they're gonna respond to any question. I'll give you one case study um, that we did. So we were working with this market research agency um, that uh, works a lot with food and beverage data. And they're like, hey, we have these products in all these countries, the US, the UK, um, Australia, Ethiopia, et cetera. By the way, this is all fake data. Um, and the idea was, well, okay, um, we have all the survey data say, hey, um, this is uh, people in the US like this type of sweetness and this level of saltiness and this level of spiciness. People in the UK like this different profile. People in Australia like this profile. People in Ethiopia like this profile. These products have all these different profiles as well, of sweetness, saltiness, spiciness, et cetera. Can we now start to predict how any of our products will fare in any of our countries, right? We have all this disparate data collected for, for you know, all these um, you know, set of countries over these set of attributes. But if we combine that, train a model on it, we can now start to say, hey, pretty confidently, this is how every country um, is, is going to operate, um, or this is the, the, the aggregate flavor profile of every single country. This is how we predict how any product will fare in that country. So what I've talked about today um, is, is two kind of uh, different products we've developed over the last few months. One is this idea of, hey, GPT is going to be a, um, a source of fraud in, in survey research, and we need to develop new algorithms to basically identify bots. Um, another, which I think is really pushing the boundaries of cognitive behavioral sciences and saying, hey, this is the best models that we have of human behavior. Can we really um, you know, leverage these models to, to, to make really um, quick and, and, and really novel insights about human behavior in a variety of settings? So going back um, to the original uh, premise, this Turing test, right? Very, very influential paper. What is artificial intelligence? What is artificial general intelligence? Transformers are on the scene. Large language models are on the scene. ChatGPT, Mistral, Llama, whatever you can name it, right? Um, I, I think um, there's this tension that we have, right? There's, there's a lot of downsides, like I talked, in that, in that kind of fraudulent space. Um, but this is really going to let us um, do different types of research, um, and, and in a way that I'm really, um, and Matt and I are, are really excited about. And so um, in the spirit of saying, you know, this academic industry collaboration, which I think, you know, this, this workshop is, is, is trying to achieve, um, I want to encourage you all to, to um, you know, be like, you know, uh, accurately critical of, of, you know, what these large language models can do and 
what they can't do and you know let's not get like too caught up in the hype but also understand that hey this is opening up new new um avenues of research and then it's going to be really exciting to see uh what comes out of it um so with that uh thank you all so much so yeah matt and i are the co-founders of roundtable um and please uh, just stop us anytime today and we'll be happy to talk to you all thank you So does anyone have a question for that? Hi, uh, thanks for the uh, great talk. I was just curious, could you uh, comment on the accuracy of your predicted query results? Because you're showing us that you can generate good query results. And, uh, maybe I missed it, but I'm just curious, like, I guess most companies would think that well, how accurate you can actually be. So can you give us an estimate of that already? Or maybe I missed it, but yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, for like, you know, training set accuracy or like training testing set accuracy, Will be within five percent, and then you know for our novel inferences, we can't like put a number on that, and that's why we give our confidence scores of low, medium, or high based on the cosine similarity scores between what the distribution and what the target question is. The five to ten percent for the uh, uh, training testing set. Um, thanks, Julio, for the talk as well. Um, I was a little bit curious about what it looks like to. Uh, Fantastic question. So one of um, uh, this is going to be a roundabout way of answering your question, but one of the first challenges that we did were like, okay, hey, um, this is trained on all the internet data. This is the best model of human behavior, kind of that we have, right? It's the best model of the behavior of the internet population, um, which is not necessarily a representative sample of you know the world population, the U.S. population, et cetera, at any specific time point, right? Which is what you're talking about especially if these models are trained to say till 2021 or, or, you know, whatever. And so one of the first things that we had to do is actually like de-bias the model and just saying, hey, don't emulate what that internet population will be. But if we're interested in say a representative sample of the US, we need to train, we need to find a bunch of additional data on like US survey data, integrate that that's representative of the US survey, integrate that um, into the model um, and then use the correlations from the, the pre-training, but then use the actual kind of representational distribution of the um, uh, of the of the fine tuning. And then to your time question, yeah. So, so one of the cool things that we do um, is saying that you can actually specify what year you want to simulate the survey. And so, so the, the survey data that we use was, was divvied up by year. So you can be like, hey, I want to. Um, so you can be like, hey, do you support the president? And you can see um, from like 2000 to 2023, right? And you can see a big spike during 9-11. You can see the, the end of the Bush era, the beginning and the ends of the Obama era, um, et cetera. And so that time um, distribution is very, very important. So yeah, great question. It's a, a kind of process question, but uh, I'm curious how you know, you've been building a startup academy uh, that is about sharing the data to begin with. Especially like when you're articulating the problem, but there's a lot of you know bots out there and people trying to fit into it. So how do you go about that? Oh, I uh, wrestle with this every single day. Um, so for the simulated surveys or for the bot problem? Um. So so for the simulated surveys, um. So so basically, companies give us their data. Um, so, so basically companies are like, hey, um, we're sitting on tons of survey data. This has been super expensive for us. We don't know how to organize this. We're not, we're, we're sitting on this proprietary data set and we're not leveraging it at all. Can you please help us um, kind of make sense of all of this? So that's kind of one of the value propositions. Um, for the bot detection, we're able to, we've essentially developed our own surveys um, and our own like sub surveys that are able to kind of, you know, get these honeypot, um, try, try to uh, attract uh, these bot and these GPT actors, and then we either integrate them into the surveys that the companies are already running, or we do like post hoc analyses just through API calls saying, hey, this is my data set. Let me just run this through um, the roundtable algorithm. They'll give me the probabilities of, of what is fraudulent and what is not. Yeah, Felix. Uh, two part question. Then the second question is what is the difference between the question asked and the question being 
Yeah. Um, so the clients give the data um, and then cosine similarity uh, for the design. Like specifically, like is it the uh, outcome variable, like the two variables that they're setting up the same place, or is it the semantics uh, is it the presentation? Uh, like, take the question embedded and the state statute that I did take it. The latter, the, the embeddings through embeddings, yeah. Right. Yeah, can I ask, so I wonder, um, are there some a subset of things that the last question is about for which it does very well? And yeah. A subset of things for which it doesn't. You know, I imagine maybe true fashion, like yeah. it's quite hard to simulate yeah. or so. Well. No, fantastic question. So um, because this is on, so at the end of the day, it's like what's in distribution, what's out of distribution. So if we are trying to, um, uh, so, so you know, we, we were you know, doing a bunch of tests. So if you're trying to identify online shopping behavior or online streaming ser service behavior, like do you watch Netflix or Hulu or you know, any of these services, we predict those super, super accurately. Um, or or you know, where, where, how often do you online shop? Like do you use Instacart, et cetera, right? Like all this data is, is essentially embedded in the web. If you ask the behavior of Seattle millionaires over the age of 80, like what their, you know, behaviors are, they're not the best represented on the internet. And so we tend to be um, not accurate on that. And so basically whenever we talk with clients, we try to identify, hey, where's this data coming from? Do we think we can be accurate in it? And, and how can we kind of demonstrate that um, accuracy? Yeah. Yeah. 